And so where are we right now? We are about, we are broaching the White Album. So um, we are on the White Album. There we go. All right, back in the USSR opens it. This is an all out rock. There are lots of blues elements in the courting because, again, we have a dominant seventh chord in the one and four position, which, whether it follows a 12 bar blues or not. Um, okay, let's do it. Let's do a quick review. Dominant seventh chord in the one and four position. Can you show us that again? Okay, real well, quick. All right. I'm going to be. Talk Will I be talking about this? Again? No, I, this is in reference to what you want to do with it. All right. All right, I, I call bar chords by form one and form two. Basically, bar chords were developed uh, out of the E shape. There's an E, uh, E minor, and E7, okay? Now, if I, if I want to move this chord up, what's happening is the strings that I don't have a finger on are not moving up with the chord. There, therefore, that's why bars were created. Now I'm doing this E with the rest of my fingers so I can leave my first finger free. Mm -hmm. Then if I move it up and bar, then I get the other strings involved. So this is an E shape here, again, is E, E minor, and E7, okay? So that's a form, what I call form one because the root name of the chord is in the low E string, all right? Mm -hmm. Form two bar chords are based on the A shape and the root will be in the A string. So you have the A shape, which can be done with a bar, Mm -hmm. these three notes. You have the A7 shape and the A minor shape. And again, if I carried this up, the other strings won't follow. So if I bar, and here's my three notes from the A chord. <coughs> now it's a B flat because I moved it. Here's A minor and here's A7. Right. All right, so we got a form one seventh chord and a form two seventh chord. Now, if I, if I start with my A note and count scale-wise up four steps, one, two, three, four, I get A, B, C sharp, D. So this is the fourth step, this is the first step, all right? So dominant seventh in the one and four positions means that here's my A note, that's the one, the very first note, and I'm basing an A7 on that, and then I count up one, two, three, four to the D note and make a D7. So that's in the one and four positions. This kind of has to do with the chord family template I've mentioned before, except that it's breaking the rules of the template. And this is the blues, man. The blues broke the rules and made something real co really cool happen that's unexplainable yet by music theory. I still, I've said this before, I still don't have a complete theory of right. blues. It's just awesome. And sometimes I think that's the nature of it. It's kind of zen. You can't know it. You can't know it in a linear fashion. You have to feel the blues. Hmm. So we have... Uh, uh, but it starts on the five chord. And by the way, it does have a blues turnaround, which is classic rock uh, R&B turnaround. But it starts on the five chord. So here's one, one, two, three, four, to the D note is four. Then a whole step up is five. One, two, three, four, five, E7, D7, A7. All right, so we have the one, four, five of the blues already built in. And in fact, it, it follows those three chords to start the song. Uh, Actually, no, it doesn't. It just, but it, it, it starts off with our E7. Oh, by the way, I, all of a sudden I'm throwing in a form that I hadn't shown you. <laughs> this is an E7. I like to use this form. The Beatles use this form a lot. It's a very handy, movable seventh chord form. And it's it comes, a C7 movable. It's, yeah, and it's also a form, too, because the root is right here on the A string again. Okay. okay. Um, you, can, you can do it either this way or this way. And this will give you, see, this has redundant roots in it. You, we have C, E, B flat, and C. But the chord uh, C7 has a G in it, too. Now, it turns out G, the, the fifth, that's called the fifth of the chord. Mm -hmm. C, uh, C, D, E, F, G, one, two, three, four, five. The fifth of the chord, G note, uh, can be eliminated very often in a chord. And you'll still get the kind of feeling and essence of the chord. There's acoustical, there's reasons for that in acoustical science that have to do with overtones. I won't go into it. Okay. Alright, so this is a C7 form right here. Alright, and then I just moved it up to E. C, D, E. And I like this form because I get to use the open low E string and the open high E string. I love chords that, that you can do that with. So you get yeah. more twanginess out of them. So the intro is... Uh, motion is very, very common in, in uh, early R&B, rock and roll type stuff, okay? Okay. All right, so, uh, so obviously McCartney is playing off of um, 
uh, the blues thing. But what we find here also is a blatant reference to uh, the Beach Boys, all right? Really out and out reference to them in the bridge. Um, uh, I just want to like, before I get more deeply into the song, I just want to say something about the White Album. I, I have a qualm with the production value of this record. I, I really think it could have been produced a whole lot better considering what they did with Peppers. Um, but the reason we have this massive amount of material coming out of them right now, they'd gone to India and they were spending time meditating and uh, in their free time they would sit and write songs. McCartney in his corner, Harrison in his corner, Lennon in his corner. So um, during that time there was just this outpouring of ideas that they were coming up with. So it only made sense that when they got back to to Britain, that, to the Abbey Road Studios, that they would, uh, you know, have separate ideas about their songs, you know, that because they kind of weren't just meditating, on, you know, on some mantra, but they were also meditating on their music and how it was going and what direction they were going to take it in, but on a personal level, on an individual level, John in his corner, Paul in his, and George in his. Um, so we get this kind of, al we get this album that's kind of like a pastiche of the separate personalities rather than the unified Beatles. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the record as much because I loved the unified Beatles. I loved that um, they were traveling together in the Yellow Submarine spreading love and joy. I, I love that whole concept. But okay. now we get a sense of uh, argumentation and discrepancy. In fact, Ringo quit the band. Mm. Technically, during the White Album, we'll talk about this later. Okay, so back, to, back in the USSR, first of all, you gotta love the song for its lyrics. It's it's really great. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some clever, clever stuff in there. You know, basically he's he's saying to Americans, "Look, man, you've got it made. You know, don't complain about what you got going in the states. You've mm -hmm. got it made, you guys." And back then we probably did. Right now it's it's become something else. But uh, back back in those days, America was a pretty amazing place. Yeah. So he's he's making a cynical statement about the USSR, and one of my favorite lines is. Uh, uh, George is always on my mind, <laughs> you know, I mean, mm -hmm. a total reference to a great American musical hero, uh, you know, Ray Charles, and actually going back further, the writer of the song was Hoagy Carmichael, very, very American song, but he's talking about the province of Georgia, oh, too, yeah. so it's really clever stuff going on there. All right, so anyway, uh, the chord progression for the verse is A7... <laughs> Seven, and now we have a surprising wandering major chord, C7, a uh, wandering 7 chord back to D7. Why this works? I, I don't know if I mentioned in our last thing, but like 7th chords, I'm starting to believe that, I think I mentioned this, there are 12 different 7th chords. You could go to ev any of the 12 different 7th seventh chords, no matter what key you're in, and find an excuse for it. It, in other words, there's a reason for it to work. Even if I go, I'm in A, and if I go A flat 7, which is a major distance away from the key of A, it brings us right up into the A chord, or a B flat 7 will bring us back into the A7. I could, I could travel over to C7 and get more of that rock sound. find on this record there's a lot of experimentation with dominant sevens, but that's been that's been the whole key to the Beatles in the very first place from the very get-go. Yes, they were they were subsumed by by classical music theory and the classical sound because it's it's so European. I mean, they, they, they couldn't avoid that. In fact, their producer was a classical musician. So we have that. But then there was this love of American roots music, which was always, always based in the blues. All right? So we have that. All right. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Great the, <clears throat> the note there for songwriters to take is learn all your seventh chords. Yeah, learn all your seventh <laughs> chords. And in this case, I, I don't often say, like, I like to go by theory in order mm -hmm. to deal with chord movement. But, but hunt and pack. Yeah. Just choose another seventh chord. Just take a random one and see what happens. <laughs> sure. All right? Nothing wrong with that. The roaming of the seventh. <laughs> Sometimes it, a little hunting and pecking is a good thing. Sure. You know, no matter how much theory you have, because uh, 
like for me, for example, I can hear the entire chord family template in my head. I can hear secondary dominance and even tritone substitution chords. But there are certain chord movements I just can't readily hear, mm. you know. And, uh, like, I have to sit and figure things out. Actually, with Glass Onion, that was the case. Um, so, uh, what happens with me is I, I, all of a sudden there's a fresh new sound that I'm not used to. It hasn't been embedded in my musical conditioning. Mm -hmm. It's, like, somewhere outside of that. And I'll go, oh, that's interesting. And then, I'll, of course, I'll try to find the theory reason for its existence. Cause sure, that's me. sure. All right, I'm talking too much about a side subject, so let's look at back on the CR. Okay. So the verse is, uh, in a way, so, and again, oh, by the way, we have that minor ninth in the melody, right? We have, all right, so we get that sound. Uh, Why does that sound like it? That would be something. Really yeah, same, same would thing, be same something. Thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, that's on the fifth, though. That goes, there is a, the suspension comes in, the fourth of, see, that's based off a D. Okay. That's the fifth, the fourth, and the third. Okay. Different song. <laughs> I didn't know you knew that song. That's a little kind yeah. of esoteric. It's off a ram, maybe? Yeah, something like that. By the way, uh, for Beatles lovers, uh, if you've never heard the McCartney Ram album, it's the closest thing that a single Beatle has done to Abbey uh, to compare with something like Abbey Road. It is really, oh, really. You something. heard it here, Paul McCartney Ram. Very richly produced, as in Abbey Road or, okay. or uh, Peppers. And in fact, with the song uh, uh, "We're So Sorry, Uncle Albert," he created a little kind of Abbey Road mel medley effect with that song. It goes into all these little different tunes that get oh, strung okay. together. Okay. You know. All right. So uh, yeah, getting back. So we get. Uh, I've been away so long. Uh, 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 what's the first lyric? Uh, uh, the jet plane into land. Back when BOAC existed. So we got A7, D7, C7, D7, same thing again. I had a triple fly. Coming back to the A7. Now we are playing off the C and D again, except the first time he's been going A7, D7, C7. But now we're going to go A7, C7, D7. So he's reversing the order. I'm back in the USSR. Back in the USSR. Blues turn around. that just came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Similar thing here. All of a sudden he's back in the U.S. Back in the U.S. Back in the U.S. But that's what takes us into the bridge. Okay? okay. The G can be explained as the seven, flat seven dominant seventh chord, uh, even though it's not dominant, even though it's not technically seventh. Any major chord can, in a blues context, can imply the seventh very strongly. Okay. And in this case... <laughs> Definitely, and there's the Fiona Apple resolution again. All right. I say that because she makes really rich use of this flat seven dominant seven. No. It's a gorgeous sound. I love the sound of it. Uh, again, it was used uh, in uh, uh, lots of Beatles music, lots, okay. uh, including uh, uh, things we said today. All right. So now. Back in the USSR. Now we get, again, a classic uh, rock and roll, early rock and roll move. Okay. Um. Now here's a cool thing. 
thing that happens here. He goes to D major, and he has a chromatic line. Uh, let's check that out in context. Actually, in the song something too. Uh, with you're asking me. Oh, there we go. All right, just a chromatic line from the root of the chord going downward. In the case of uh, back in the USSR, it doesn't go all the way down to the fifth. It goes down to the uh, second. And the cool thing about this is this is a B minor chord, B minor 7 chord, which forms the two that would go to the 5-7. In jazz theory, is, I talked about two fives, I think, in the last uh, video. This is a 2-5 that takes us back home. Okay. Except, in the case of this one, it's a blues thing, so he doesn't go... He goes... All right, so we get the blues resolution, 4 to 1 resolution. Okay, so, um... was thinking of uh, Drive My Car. In fact, I think the Beatles in general were thinking a little bit about the song Drive My Car. Ah. With this song. There's a lot of similarity between mm -hmm. the two, including that minor ninth in the melody. You know? Alright, that, that, that comes up. And also, um, the, uh, in the solo for this, Harrison is exploiting that minor ninth by starting on the very offensive note of the minor nine. Ah. All the Beatles have been saying, fuck you, Vinny, to, to this one concept of the minor ninth that I have a hard time with. Ah. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I hate the interval. <coughs> I can't stand it. Especially, well, you know, sometimes it's used really blatantly wrong, wrongly, and it's just a dissonance, and it's not a good one as far as I'm concerned, but that's me. Were you using for a short time on one of these rises along here a uh, uh, power chord? What, what was oh, yeah. the basis of a power chord, right? Right, and these are called, called five chords. Uh, this is called A5. There's no other word. Uh, the power chord isn't a chord. That's right. the problem. It's just two notes. It's just two notes. But yeah, for the climbs. And you can also do that on the A and D string. Absolutely, sure. yeah, power chords. I tend to, like, I'm not doing, I never do exactly what's on the record. Like, I, I know enough about music where it's like, I know this chord will cover for this, or, the, you know, the power chord, nobody's going to notice the difference. I try to teach my students this. You don't have to do the exact thing on the record when you're learning how to, how to work out a song, you know. Yeah. And I've proved this over and over again. I have one student that lately he's been listening to these, like, kind of electronic uh, dance pieces that have no guitar in it, mm -hmm. but they have chords. And he'll, he'll wind up like, we'll eke out the chords from the song, and then he'll wind up doing an acoustic version at this cafe yeah. that he plays at. So, uh, you know, the funny thing is, people never notice. I mean, um, you know the old, the old saying about fooling 100% of the people 100% of the time. I've mm -hmm. always said, like, if you're, if you're a non-musician, you can, uh, if you're a musician playing to non-musicians, mm -hmm. I, I hate to say this, but it's true, uh, you can fool 100% of the people 100% <laughs> of the time. 